one of our favorite people here at the Oasis is Harmony Dust, and she's our guest today. She has uh, founded a great ministry here called Treasures, where she uh, reaches out to young women in the sex industry and presents the love of Christ to them, uh, shows them a path of healing and, and renewal. She's written a lot about her journey in this book called Scars and Stilettos. And so we just are really uh, proud of her, the work that God has done in her. She's been uh, featured in Glamour magazine, on Tyra Banks show, and many other places where the, the word of her work has gotten around. And so I know you're going to be inspired today. And I want to ask you to stand with us and just give a great Oasis welcome as Harmony of Dust comes to bring the message. like Arsenio Hall or something. <laughs> Thank you. Aren't the, isn't the band awesome? <laughs> love this band. Um, my name is Harmony, and I love Oasis. This is my home church. This is where I'm from. I walked in the doors about 13 years ago as really a broken girl who came from a background of sexual abuse and rape and growing up in a household where there was domestic violence, and my mom was struggling with an addiction to cocaine. And I walked through these doors, and I found a home. I found restoration. I found healing. I found a safe community to just embark on my faith journey and engage in my relationship with God. And so if you're here today and you're not sure what you think about God or you're not sure what you think about church or anything like that, you are in the right place. This is a good and safe place to learn about God and to develop a relationship with Him. So... Welcome. We're very glad to have you. I am also, um, as, as, as Pastor Philip mentioned, the founder of Treasures, and we are an outreach and support group to women in the sex industry. And I have the honor of reaching women in the sex industry with the message that they are loved, valued, and purposed. We go to strip clubs and porn conventions, and we offer peer mentoring, a therapist-led support group, and just tools and resources to help the women live the flourishing lives that they were called to live. And it's my honor to do that. And so today we're talking about porn, and I love that we're in a church that is not afraid to talk about sex and talk about porn because I think it is so important that we learn to integrate our sexuality with our faith because our sexuality is part of who we are as human beings. And so it's important that we are able to talk about this and have this dialogue inside of church because we're having it outside of church. We might as well talk about it in the context of God's word and, and looking at it in light of God's word. And I personally am committed to the porn industry I'm not committed to the movies they make, but I'm committed to the people in it. And recently, Treasures has had an incredible opportunity to position ourselves in a very strategic location. Our new office space is located in the San Fernando Valley in Sherman Oaks. And not only is it the porn capital of the world, 95% of all porn is filmed, manufactured, and or distributed in the San Fernando Valley. But more specifically, our new office space is located right next to an organization called AIM. And AIM is the medical clinic where every single person that is actively working in porn is required to do HIV testing every single month. And so I think they have a picture of our new offices. Then we can, oh, they already showed it. Okay, so the green building was AIM. The white building is the new treasurer's office. And we just figured what better way to practice loving your neighbor as yourself than to literally become their neighbor. And so now we are porn's neighbor. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And actually, we've had some great people that are part of this church, Glendale, Matt Fretchel, a bunch of guys donating their time to do design and construction work and painting and you name it to make this space beautiful because we want to create an environment that will take the women's breath away and that when they walk in, that the environment itself will reflect the value that we place on their lives because God values their lives. So that's the idea. And... Porn, I think, is an important thing to talk about because it's affecting our culture and it's affecting our churches. According to a Focus on the Family poll, poll couples said that in 40% of homes, porn was a problem in their household. Also, we learned that men between the ages of 18, 20, 18 to 25, up to 70%, are struggling with addiction to pornography. And it's not just men. One in three visitors to porn websites are women. And with the accessibility of porn because of the internet, these numbers are on the rise. 
And actually, there are 116,000 searches for child pornography every single day. So it's important we talk about this. So one of the things I want to do today is talk about three of the major myths regarding porn and just kind of spend some time debunking the myth. And before I do that, I just want to say that nothing of what I'm saying is meant out of judgment or condemnation. We serve a gracious God who is a redeemer and a restorer, and it does not matter what you have done up until this moment. You walked into this room. All that matters is what you decide to do from here. God is gracious. He is a redeemer. And maybe you believed these myths. Maybe you've acted out on some of these myths. That's okay. Just start where you're at right now and know that God is gracious. Okay? Sound good? All right. So myth number one is that porn is empowering to women. And the argument goes something like this, that women in porn are there by choice and good for them for using what God gave them to get ahead in life or maybe get their education. And I remember... Um, oh, and the, the other thinking in this is that the women who end up messed up, doped up, beat up, or dead just weren't cut out for the industry in the first place, and they're sort of an anomaly. And I remember when I was first thinking of going into sex work as a stripper, I decided to ask some advice of the people around me because here I was in this abusive relationship for seven years with a guy who was leading me into sex work because um, he knew he was going to profit off of that. And so I asked a couple of people. One of the people I asked was my psychology professor at school. At the time, I was still had plans of getting a PhD in psychology and wanted a career in that field. And so I went to him because I respected him. And what I heard from him is, it's totally fine. It's not like you have to put it on your resume. And then sure enough, a couple months later, he came into the club and his intentions were clear at that point. The other person I asked was my boss at the time. I was working for a school district as a teacher's aide. And I remember she said, if I were you, I'd do it too. Go for it. And the idea is, is that your body and your sexuality are a commodity that can be bought and sold and used to gain power and wealth. That's the thinking in this, um, in this myth that porn is empowering to women. And it's this line of thinking that can be especially enticing to a population of women where up to 90% of women in the sex industry were sexually abused as children. And the reason this line of thinking can be so appealing is because as someone who has been sexually abused and as a victim of sexual abuse, in that moment, in that experience, you are powerless. One of the things that you hear as themes among victims of sexual abuse is the sense that your body is not your own. So you are disempowered in being victimized by sexual abuse. And so, so many women, including myself, think, you know what, I'm going to go into this line of work and I'm going to take back control. I'm going to take back control of my sexuality and I'm going to use for myself what was used against me. But we find very shortly that that is absolutely not the case. And if porn were empowering to women, we would not see such a high rate of substance abuse issues among women in this group. I hear, I have heard stories of many women that can't even get through a night working at the strip club or working a day on a porn set without using some kind of alcohol or other, other mind-altering substances. And in two th between 2007 and 2010, at least 36 porn stars have died from either HIV, suicide, homicide, or drugs. If porn were empowering to women, we wouldn't see stats like this. There is a woman who is a part of Treasures. She's been um, a part of our therapist-led support group, and we're so proud of her. She's an ex-porn star who's a mother and who's actually now going back and working really hard to get her education. And recently, she wrote a paper for one of her classes about porn. And I think she just did such a beautiful job of telling her own personal story and mixing it with empirical data to really shed some light on um, the experience of women in this industry. And I, I don't have time to read you the whole thing. It's up on our website at IamATreasure.com in the blog section, so if you want to check out the whole thing, you're welcome to, but I just wanted to read you a portion of what she wrote. Women don't realize that in this business, everyone is expendable. There is always going to be a steady supply of fresh young faces to take your place. If your body and face aren't in top condition, you risk being put on public blast when reviews come around. For a lot of young women, the false sense of security is shattered the first time they're not the center of attention on set or the first time that they get sent home for being too fat. Many girls turn to drugs to manage their weight, cope with constant scrutiny, and deal with a rigorous schedule. At some point in every porn career, a performer will be asked to do something that she doesn't want to do. 
And it's at this point that is often the crossover point due to the fact that their money and or reputation are on the line. Sadly, a lot of agents will push their talent into performing outside of their comfort zone. They threaten loss of representation and withholding of money. Many agents will stoop to degrading their clients as a means of manipulating them to get what they want. They will call them names and tell them they are worthless. The worse that they can make these girls feel about themselves, the more these li girls are likely to do to win back their attentions. The agent-client relationship is really not that different from that of a pimp and a prostitute. Everything is great as long as you're making them money. And I wish I could tell you that her experience is an isolated one, but it's not. When we see women walk through our doors coming to get support, they're not coming to us because they had an experience in the sex industry that was empowering them, empowering to them. They're coming to get the tools to become empowered. And I just, in all fairness, I also want to say that it's not just women that are in the sex industry, it's also men. And I just found a really powerful quote from a man who is not only a porn producer, but also a porn performer. And especially in light, if you've been um, around Oasis for the past few weeks, we, you know that we've taken some time and focused on issues like sex trafficking. And especially in light of this, I just thought that this was a really powerful quote to share with you. He says, I find myself not that much unlike the slaves and slave traders of some 400 years ago. I participate in the most heinous of all trades, the buying and selling of human flesh. I trade my own flesh for monetary compensation, and I sell the flesh of others for the same. Even Jenna Jameson, who is one of the largest female porn stars of all time, and who is who people point to as being a picture of a woman in porn who is empowered. She managed to carve out a career for herself on the production end of porn in a, an industry that is dominated by males. And people will say, well, look at Jenna. She carved out this role for herself, and she has been empowered by porn. But even Jenna herself, when she was asked whether or not she would recommend this line of work, she said, no, it's a hard lifestyle, and I made the choice, but I don't recommend it to anybody. I remember when I was first coming to Oasis, and I was still just in a really broken place, and I showed up at a God Chicks lunch. Actually, this is so long ago. I'm dating myself 13 years ago, but we still called them wave meetings at the time, and um, I remember showing up there and sitting across from a girl. She had just gone through a really bad breakup, and I could just tell that she was also kind of hurting herself, and she, I remember she said to me, she looked at me with tears in her eyes, and she said, Harmony, one day we are going to look at ourselves and say, wow. I am a virtuous woman of God. And that just so stood out to me because really there was a part of me that couldn't even fathom the idea that I could get to a place in my life where I would be able to confidently say, I am a virtuous woman of God. I was working as a stripper. But that thought was empowering to me. And I committed to learning what God's picture of female empowerment looked like. And we see a picture of this. It's God's picture of feminine empowerment is embodied in the Proverbs 31 woman. And if you read about the Proverbs 31 woman who's known as a virtuous woman of God, you hear that sh her value is far above rubies and pearls. She is a businesswoman selling, making and selling garments and using her profits to purchase land. The Bible says that her arms are strong for her tasks, that her children will rise and call her blessed, that she has no fear for her household, that her husband trusts her, that she is clothed with strength and dignity and can laugh at the days to come. This is a picture of godly female empowerment. And this picture was empowering to me. So the second myth I want to talk about is the idea that porn is a safe and healthy way for me to explore my sexuality. And the thinking behind this is really that just porn is fantasy. Nobody's really getting hurt here. And, you know, every guy has their strip club or porn experience and as if it's really a hallmark of what it means to be a man. The thinking is that porn can help women be free in their sexuality and that it's an outlet for people who would otherwise do bad things, like maybe cheat on their spouses or act out on, uh, on um, sexual aggression. And I remember even when I was at UCLA getting my master's in social welfare, we had a therapist who was a relationship therapist come in that, you know, the school brought in to teach us about relationship therapy. And she shared with us that often when couples came to her for help with their sex lives, she suggested that they watch porn together. This myth is very prevalent in our culture that porn is a safe and healthy way 
for us to explore our sexuality. And we see it operating in scenarios that we hear about where, for example, a dad will hand their son a Playboy magazine rather than having the sex talk with them and let them learn about their sex and sexuality from Playboy. Or situations where you hear of where someone purchases a prostitute for a young teenage boy so that he doesn't have to deal with the stigma of being a virgin. Or in situations where housewives feel, feel like they need to learn how to dance like a stripper or read books like how to make love like a porn star so they can be sexually compatible for their spouses. But maybe the real truth is, is that we don't know what se healthy sexuality looks like and we are buying our ideas from a media and an industry that is so willing to capitalize off of our ignorance. And that's why I think we need to talk about this in church. So debunking the myth. Are you guys still with me? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, when I speak often, I just get kind of deer in headlights. And it's cool, I know, because you guys are like, you know, thinking about this and stuff. That's great. That's cool. Okay, so pornography is a safe and healthy way to explore my sexuality. Last week when we kicked off this series, Pastor spent some time talking about what, what healthy sexuality looked like. And he talked about the idea that sex was given to us for a couple of things. It was given to us for reproduction. It was given to us for intimacy and connection. And it was given to us for pleasure. And porn is really just about pleasure. It takes the reproduction piece out of it. It takes the intimacy and connectedness piece out of it. And it just reduces it to purely being about pleasure. And we know that porn really isn't about relationship because the truth is, is most people, 67% of people who watch porn do it alone. So this is not about facilitating intimacy and relationship. Because the truth is, real relationship requires work. It's messy it requires that your heart is invested. It requires that you're, you put your heart at risk for relational pain. And I can see why this would be so alluring to some people who are maybe afraid of getting hurt in real relationship and this is the only alternative they can see to feel like they're having some kind of connection. I can see how that would be a draw. But the truth is, porn takes all of the intimacy and connection part out of sex because really you're just having a sexual encounter with a screen. I found this quote, and I love the wording on it. It's a stat, actually. If you know me, you know I love stats. <laughs> the National Coalition for the Protection of Children and Families states that approximately 40 million people in the United States are sexually involved with the Internet. Can you imagine that on your Facebook status? You're married, singled, it's complicated, in a relationship, sexually involved with the Internet. I'm just saying a lot of people are. It's the truth. <laughs> It's the truth. And if porn were a healthy way for us to explore sexuality, we wouldn't hear things like the fact that in 2002, during a conference where matrimonial attorneys got together, they said that excessive porn use was the cause of more than 50% of the divorces they handled that year. Another argument that porn is a safe and healthy way to explore our sexuality comes in the form of, you know, it's this idea that it's it would prevent people from acting out on impulses like cheating on their spouses or like doing things like acting out on sexual aggression. But because of the progressive and addictive nature of porn, the opposite is actually true. <laughs> so basically addiction is broken down into two categories. There is substance addiction, which is like cocaine or alcohol or substances such as that, and there are behavioral addictions. And gambling would be an example of something that falls into the category of behavioral addiction. And porn in excessive use would also fall into this category. And so what happens with excessive porn use or any kind of porn use, it stimulates what's called the reward circuitry in your brain. And it's this circuitry that stimulates the production of a neurochemical called dopamine. And dopamine is known as the craving chemical because it causes you to feel feel pleasure and, and excitement and, and enjoyment. And over time, excessive use of porn actually leads to a lowering of dopamine levels. So that actually there's this sense that something is missing, that you need something, and that's the basis of addictive craving, is that, you're, that that dopamine level is lowered. And so chronic use of porn can actually lead to an overall lowered sexual state, a flattened state. 
So in the same way that that line of cocaine doesn't have the same impact that it did the first time and more is required to produce the same result, behavioral addiction such as porn addiction is the same way. More is required, not less. So where that fantasy or that image might be enough in the first place, then you take it to the computer screen. And when the computer screen isn't enough, then you move it to online chats. And when that's not enough, then you're acting out on the outside and cheating on your spouse. So more is required. It's, it's escalating in its nature. It was found that the relationship between sexually violent images in the media and subsequent aggression, meaning when you see these sexually violent images and then act out afterwards, is stronger statistically than the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. So the idea that you're going to be able to get out these impulses just by doing it in a safe way with porn is actually a complete myth that's, that's backed by evidence and studies. So porn, I don't think, is a, a healthy part of exploring your sexuality. I often think that it's used as a substitute for a healthy sex life and a healthy sexuality. So porn myth number three. Welcome to church on a Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> you guys happy you didn't know what you're getting into. <laughs> All right, so myth number three. If your spouse watches porn, something is wrong with you. And the truth is, for every person that is struggling with porn addiction or some kind of sexual addiction, there's often a spouse or a significant other that is suffering too. And it's that same sense of shame that would keep someone who's struggling with the addiction from speaking out and getting help that would keep the spouse or the partner from talking about it as well. And I think one of the biggest lies that partners believe from what I've seen is the idea that it's their fault, that there's something they could do to fix it. There's a group called COSA, which stands for Codependent Women in Relationship with Sexually Addicted Men. And this is a support group that's through the 12-step program, which actually we have the Christ-centered version of the 12-step program here at Oasis, Celebrate Recovery, which you've heard us talk about and we'll hear more about later. But this group offers support to women in relationship with sexually addicted men. And they have found that there are some, some patterns in the women who are in these relationships. And some of the things that they find are a tendency to cover up and ignore or hide the addict's behavior, a tendency to stifle their inner voice telling them that something is wrong, Failure to hold the addict accountable for their, for their behaviors and addictions. Compromising their own beliefs to give in to what the addict wants. And this is the biggest one. Blaming themselves for the addict's behavior. For example, if only I were prettier, if only I were skinnier, then this wouldn't be happening. And I think that last lie is one of the biggest ones. I have a friend who learned this the hard way. I have the honor of mentoring her. She is one of the biggest porn stars to ever leave porn for Jesus. And um, at the height of her career, she was one of the top girls in the industry. And I, you know, people would say that she's the prototype of what it means to be a porn star. And at that point in her career, her boyfriend was still going to strip clubs and still watching porn and still dealing with this himself. And she couldn't understand. Here she is thinking, I am the porn star. I am like one of the top girls there, there is in the industry. So why are you struggling with this? But the truth is, it had nothing to do with her. You will never be skinny enough. You will never pre be pretty enough. You will never be sexy enough to fix an addict's addiction because it's insatiable in its nature and it has nothing to do with you. Even women in porn have a hard time living up to the standard of what it means to be a porn star. That's why you see them undergoing breast augmentation and cheek implants and chin implants and lip injections and lip augmentation and tummy tucks and all of these cosmetic surgeries because women in porn have a hard time looking like porn stars. Right? <laughs> And this is actually very sad. Just on January 20th, there was a 23-year-old German porn star who died undergoing her sixth breast augmentation, struggling. She died to look like a porn star. Last week, Philip talked about healthy sexuality, and he talked about Song of Solomon. And it's a, 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 a chapter in the Bible, a a book of the Bible that is a dialogue between a groom and his bride. And in Song of Solomon 4-7, the groom says to his bride, You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no 
flaw in you. God's love, God's picture of healthy sexuality is honoring. It's uplifting. It's edifying. Porn says you will never be enough. Sex addiction says you will never be enough. But God's picture of healthy sexuality is honoring. And I can't go into in-depth here on solutions if you are someone who's in a relationship with someone who's struggling with sex addiction. And you may hear me saying it's not your fault, you can't fix it, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing you can do. You can learn to set healthy boundaries, you can get support, and um, there is actually a section on the Treasures website called Help for Spouses, and you can go there and just get some tools um, to help you you if you are dealing with this yourself. So as I've been talking today, I imagine that maybe there are people in this room who have been in the sex industry, maybe men or women, or maybe there are people in this room who maybe you've not been in the industry, but you know what it means to try to use your sexuality to gain a sense of power. Or maybe you're someone who struggles with sex addiction or the spouse of someone who struggles with sex addiction. There are a few key things that I think can bring solution no matter where you stand with this, that I just want to go through. I'm going to go through them kind of quickly because they're simple. They're not easy. I'm not going to lie and say they are easy, but they are simple. The three things. The first one, confess to God. He knows. Let's face it. You can't hide anything from him anyways. And he is gracious and he is loving. And the Bible says that if you confess your sins to him, he will forgive your sins and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Confess to God. Take it to him. He loves you right now as you are in your mess. Doesn't matter. The second thing, confess to someone else. The Bible says that we are to confess our sins to one another that we may be healed. This is a part of the healing journey. That's why programs like Celebrate Recovery are so successful because they put this principle into practice. That there is a safe community of people where you can talk about your junk and you could just be honest and real and just as real about it as you want to because we all have it. None of us have arrived. We have all have junk and we're all working it out. We are all on a journey. So that's the second one. The third one is to surrender your sexuality to God. Maybe you've surrendered your life, and maybe this is a totally new concept, but surrender your sexuality to God. Make a decision to learn how to integrate your faith with your sexuality. And I just want to take a moment and have you hear the story of someone who knows what it means to walk out this process. And he has a very powerful story, and um, I just wanted him to come up and, and share it with you tonight. Harmony, thank you just for some of the stuff you've shared with us already. Uh, I introduced myself earlier. My name's Chad, part of the staff here at Oasis. Excited to be with you guys. Um, excited. That this is Stephen Kiefer. He is a key leader in our church. Uh, him and his wife are good friends of ours as well, and they have uh, two beautiful daughters. Uh, but just he's going to share a little bit of his story with us, and, and our hope is that you might be sitting there in a similar situation, and that his story is going to bring some hope, and uh, just some understanding for what victory looks like. So I guess, Stephen, just, we'll just jump right in. What age and how were you exposed to pornography? I think the first time that I um, like looked at pornography was through a magazine, and I must have been about 10 years old. Yeah. And then, so, so at 10 years old, looking at pornography with some friends, how did it escalate from that point on? Um, looking at magazines at a friend's house, maybe went from passing around videos at school, and then I, I think just eventually that led just to on, an online relationship with the internet. Is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what I eventually got to. Hopefully that wasn't a Facebook status update, but um, and I, I know part of your story, I know is that you grew up in Switzerland, and then you moved here to the, to the U.S. How did that play a role in your pornography usage increasing? Well, I think prior to coming here, I had already had this, this uh, um, lifestyle of uh, using porn. It's just porn was part of my life and it was normal, but I think leaving my family and leaving my friends, um, getting into more of an isolated state, really just impacted that lifestyle. And I just think that's when it escalated. It went from an hour to like two hours. I'm talking daily here, you know? to literally just out of hand. And even at that point, I don't think I realized that it was an addiction. It was just me doing what guys do and a little bit more because maybe I just needed it a little bit more. You know? 
So as things escalated, you talked about not even realizing at the point that it was an addiction or that it was something that you were struggling with. What was it that caused you to realize that you had an addiction to pornography and, and it was a problem? Well, um, it didn't stay at looking at porn. As we heard, this is something that is, uh, usually goes through stages. And I had a, a relationship at the time, an eight-year relationship, really, um, and I had destroyed that relationship. I mean, it went from cheating on a girlfriend to... Uh, uh, prostitutes uh, and it really just escalated, you know. And me realizing that at the time um, meant for for that girlfriend to just call it quits. And I mean, it went from breaking up to getting back together to breaking up. But at some point, she had the courage to say, "Enough is enough," and just step away. And I think that's when I hit rock bottom, and I realized something needs to change. So during this time period of you know, on-again, off-again relationship with your girlfriend of about eight years. During that time period, did you try and stop and you weren't able to, or were you just continuing and hoping that she wouldn't find out? Both. <laughs> yeah, no, but it got to the point where obviously a lot of times I really tried to stop, you know, by my own willpower, but that just doesn't work. You know, I think anybody that's been in this or is using porn or, or is in that lifestyle a little bit and un understands that there's some guilt or something there where they realize they're doing something wrong probably was at the point where they wanted to stop and it just doesn't work by sheer willpower. You can't do that. So I think it came to the point where I had to have this honest conversation with God and just say, look, this part is yours. I just let go of it, you know. That's awesome. So going through this, lose this relationship, lose somebody incredibly important to you at the time trying with willpower, that, that didn't work. You know, so many people try and do it, we try and do it on our own, and we're unsuccessful. And you obviously hinted at this, but what was it that allowed you to have victory, to break this addiction? I remember one night that I was literally sitting on the side of the street, um, and this was, you know, after I realized that this woman was gone for good, you know, and I, and I just said, God, you know, um, I want a second chance. And I think it was then when I had this little list in the back of my pocket of a wife that I would like to have one day. And, um, and God came through for me, thankfully. I have a beautiful wife, as, as Jab mentioned, beautiful kids. But um, I think it was just literally this honest conversation with God and saying, I want to pursue you instead of trying to fight this porn thing, you know. I was not willing anymore to lose these fights. And so I said, Lord, I need you to take this fight on for me so that I could pursue other things and pursue you. That's great. That's awesome just to hear how victory came in your life and just surrendering that area to God and, and His faithfulness. You know, so the truth is, in a room this size, as we've heard some of the statistics from Harmony and, and different things that we've learned and the amount of people that are joining us online, there is a good portion of us right now who are struggling with this. And so what would you say to us? I think the main thing is purpose. But that's such a vague expression sometimes, especially for guys. I think guys, a lot of times, we just want to fight. We just want to get out there and want to do something. I mean, me, I'm an intense guy. Sometimes I would just want to go and, like, rip stuff apart and do things, you know. <laughs> but, but a lot of times, I don't know what that is. You know, I, I don't know what to, where to fight or, or how to attack something. And I think that's when a lot of guys fall into this lost space. And I think that's the danger zone, especially when it comes to porn and everything, because we just draw back and, you know, we kind of feel like we're not really walking out that purpose. We don't know where to apply our strength and our focus and all of that. So I think just purpose, finding purpose is what it is. And, you know, I didn't want this to be my story. <laughs> I didn't think, like, oh, how cool would it be to be on a stage and say, like, yeah, you know, I you know, used, you know, lost girlfriends because of prostitutes. And, <laughs> you know? but, but, but I was the guy that prayed to God a lot and said, you know, use me. I want to be a warrior of yours. I want to be a fighter. And, and maybe he's saying, well, here's your battlefield. You know, maybe this is my fight. So I just wonder if maybe guys out there, maybe you guys have to tackle this fight first. Maybe this is where you need to apply your, your strength to. And it, it might take faith. It might take a step of courage. But maybe this is your battle. This is, you know, the field. The zone. And you can do this by just showing up, you know. We don't need healed, super strong warriors. We just need people that are honest, willing to come together and find that band of brothers and that strength. And you know, we have the tools now, you know. Uh, Thursday, CR is there to equip us with tools and weapons, you know. And so I, I just think finding purpose. That's awesome. Stephen, thank you very much.
In just a moment, I'm going to hand it back off to Harmony, but I, and she's just going to lead us in a prayer. But I just love Stephen's story. The reality of what the enemy meant for darkness, what the enemy meant to keep Stephen from ever walking in and fulfilling the purpose that God had for him, he is now using as an opportunity to bring freedom to other people. And so not only is Stephen leading and, and helping with this fight of freeing other men from sexual addiction, pornography, different things, but there's a whole other area that Stephen is gifted and passionate about, and that is he is a gifted and passionate business owner that plays a key role in, in some of the generosity that we see in this church. And so it's so cool to see some of the different things in his moment of obedience and courage and then sharing his story to bring freedom to other people. And so I believe that there's going to be testimonies from these seats, from the people that are joining us online, that we have surrendered an area of our life to God, surrendered our sexuality, and allowed Him to use that to bring freedom to other people. Harmony, can you pray for us? Definitely. Another hand for Stephen. The truth is, is that you hear him get up here and share his story and me get up here and share my story. And the reason we can be so bold and honest about things that most people don't want to talk about is because we have had an encounter with God that has literally transformed our lives. We have experienced the redeeming hand of God and his utter inexplainable grace. And so I just want to ask everyone just to join me in an attitude of prayer. And I just want to pray with you and extend an opportunity to you. For those of you who are here and maybe you've been walking with God before, but you've never experienced this kind of grace and this kind of life-transforming power, God wants you to engage with him and to experience that. And maybe you're here and you've, you don't know God and you don't know this God that we're talking about. Well, I'm telling you that this is the kind of God we serve. He is gracious. He is loving. He is redeeming. He is healer. He is restorer. So with everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, just privately, this is your own private moment with God. If that's you and if you're in this room and you want to engage with God and like never before, then just raise your hand. Awesome. There are hands all over this room all over this room. You are not alone. And I know this can be a tough one, but you are not alone. God is with you, and I just come against the lie of the enemy that would want you to believe that you are alone in this. Awesome. God, I just thank you for every hand lifted, every heart that's in this place, Lord, that you would do a deep, and mighty healing work in their lives, God, that they would never be the same, God, that you would just transform them from the inside out, God, that they would experience your love and your grace like never before, God, that they would have a revelation of who you are and what you want to do in their lives, God. I thank you that each of them is purposed, each of them has a call, and that your plans for them are good, plans to prosper them and give them a hope and a future, plans of redemption, that and you are the kind of God that can and will use every single thing the enemy meant for harm and use it for good in their lives. And we praise you and thank you for this in Jesus' name, that this would be a defining moment in their lives, that they would look back and remember this moment as being the moment they decided to engage with you, to engage their faith, to surrender their sexuality, and to live for you. I praise you and thank you for this moment and for each of their lives, and that you are faithful to complete the work that you have begun. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.